more patience as we were some, uh, some of those technical difficulties. So we're just resetting that recording. Thanks folks for coming back from your breakouts where we were discussing uh, what is one hope you have for schools in your community this year. And in the spirit of our norms and moving up and moving back, I'm gonna ask folks to share just one thing that they heard from their breakout rooms so that we can have as many folks participate as possible, but also keep us moving through the agenda. We got a packed, a lot of information to share tonight, um, but would love to hear just as we begin the new year, this 2022 calendar year, what are some of the hopes that we have for schools in our community? So can I have someone come off of mute and share one thing from your group, either that you shared or that really resonated with you? And feel free to just pop off of mute. We talked about just stability and a return to normalcy. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. We talked Others. About several comments about, about health and safety. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Health and safety. Getting rid of the anger that's here right mm -hmm. now, and also staffing and teachers, mm -hmm. the issues with that. Great. Hope that go, can come back to normalcy. Supporting our educators, finding some common ground and some unity. Yeah. Other um, I think they're talking about buying down the negative factor, which would put $570 million more into school funding. We will absolutely talk about what we think we understand about that current proposal. Uh, Ed. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, suspending the, uh, the, the high stakes testing this year so that uh, teachers can teach to the students instead of the test. Mm -hmm. Great, others? Someone mentioned Any? looking forward to getting the social studies standards updated to be more inclusive. Yes, we will be sharing our petition link again at the end of this meeting as an opportunity for you to take action. The beginning of this week when I checked back in on our petition, we had over 800 signatures and our goal is uh, to get as many signatures as possible before the February state board meeting. So we will be sharing that link again in this meeting so that you can make sure that you've signed that petition, but there's still a few weeks left to share um, that petition with folks in our community. So we're gonna ask you to do that later today. Awesome, well, I'm starting to hear us tiptoe our way into the learn portion of our section today. So I am going to start sharing my screen again. And we are really excited again to start this new year um, with our legislative preview for 2022. And one of the things before we jump in and start talking about the legislature and the legislative process, um, I wanna do just a quick school funding refresher. This is going to be at the 30,000 foot level, um, but we have folks who are experts in this topic, who are new to this topic, but everyone here wants to see positive change. So I wanna make sure that we come together to this topic with a shared sense of understanding and some shared facts so that we can talk legislative uh, priorities and legislative strategy. So high level, uh, when we fund schools here in Colorado, and like is typical many states across the country, this is a, uh, a balance of funding between local sources and states, uh, state level sources. So in Colorado, um, our predominant local source of funding is local property taxes. And our largest investment from the state level is the state's general fund. This general fund is largely made up of state income taxes that uh, for individuals and corporations, as well as the statewide sales tax. So we have local and state sales tax. So the state sales tax largely feeds into the general fund. When we look at just all 178 school districts together and the total amount that we spend on K-12 education, about for every dollar that is generated at the local level, the state backfills $2. So it's about a two to one ratio currently. So how do we decide then how much money each of our 178 districts receive through this uh, allocation year over year? And this is done through a state funding formula. The funding formula has three basic components. The first component is the base amount per pupil that is enrolled in every district. So standard practice across, uh, across the country is funding districts by a per pupil basis. And so each student in Colorado receives a base amount and that is constitutionally protected 
and grows by inflation every year. So this is the base of a total program. We acknowledge and recognize in our funding formula that different districts and different students have different needs based off of their context, based off of their characteristics. And so one of the things we have equity factors that add additional resources into the allocation for districts. Some of those are about the characteristics where students are enrolled. So for example, smaller districts receive a bump in the funding formula because they have fewer students and a smaller economy of scale. So the cost of being able to have the types of staffing or, or needs that you have is stretched across fewer students. So we give a bump in the formula to districts that have a smaller enrollment size. Also in the uh, district characteristics bucket is what is the cost of business or cost of living in your district? So if it is more expensive to live, um, to do business, um, there is a bump, uh, a cost of living adjustment that happens inside of the formula as well. On the student characteristics side, students, historically, the student factor has been called an at-risk factor. And so just from an equity perspective, I think we should be critical and thoughtful of what the term at risk actually means. And it's not my favorite label, but essentially what at risk is attempting to approximate is students who are living below the federal poverty line, because we know that additional resources will help um, provide students uh, with the educational supports and resources that they may need. And so historically, we have put a bump into the formula for students who qualify for free lunch. As of last legislative session, that at-risk indicator has now included free and reduced price lunch. And we also have added for the first time emerging bilinguals as a student characteristic in the funding formula. So students who might be earning learning English as a second language. Students are not qualified under, are not counted under both. So if I qualify for free and reduced lunch and I'm an emerging bilingual, I'm only counted as one uh, in one of those categories. So we have the base. We recognize that different districts and different students might uh, have different needs, so we provide additional resources. But the very last uh, part of the school funding formula, and we went in depth in this in our November Advocates Network meeting. So if you want to learn more, check out that recording on our website. But the very last uh, factor applied to the formula is the BS factor, the budget stabilization factor, or the borrowing from students factor. This is a subtractive factor that takes money away uh, from the final total program number. Historically, at its creation at, after the 2008 recession was used to balance the budget, but for the last 13 years, we've continued to use the BS factor to borrow money from students to pay for other priorities in the state budget, even in times of economic strength and um, high economic performance. For example, Colorado is the second strongest economy in the country, according to US News and World Report. Um, this year, even as we recover from the pandemic, but we are still $572 million in the hole because of the budget stabilization factor. So base, add the factors, subtract from the factors through the budget stabilization factor. And that number for each district is called their total program. To then actually allocate that total program, we figure out first at the local level, how much money was generated from local property taxes. And then for each district, depending on how much is left in that bar graph, the state fills the rest. So just that baseline of how do we go from uh, the funding formula to actually looking at that at the district level. A few things that happen outside of total program, and these are marginal, and uh, really the funding formula is the meat and potatoes of what school districts get, and these are just additional dollars um, that are far less significant than total program. But we have a bucket called categoricals. And today we're going to talk about the special education categorical because there are some proposed changes to special education funding. Um, but these uh, are also constitutionally protected dollars that once the legislature puts money into a categorical fund, that fund is required to also grow by inflation each year. We use that for things like special education, gifted and 
talented. Some of it is used for transportation, career technical education. Um, and so we, uh, as Great Ed, believe that these are also woefully underfunded, but these are dollars that are available to districts. Districts are also able to mill levy override. That is a whole other topic that I will go deeper on in a future Advocates Network meeting. Um, but we also, districts, receive federal funding. And federal funding historically has been through the Title I program to provide uh, additional funding um, for districts who serve students uh, that have a high concentration of poverty. Um, but we also right now are experiencing um, an investment from the federal government that are one-time dollars that will disappear in the 2023-24 school year, which are called ESSER dollars. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well, because that will have an impact on our legislative session. So I know I just whipped through that, wanted to give folks some level of an overview, but if you're interested in going deeper, if something I said sparked some curiosity in you, there is a QR code on your screen that will take you to the Great Ed website where you can sign up for a presentation. Um, the slides that I just used are a preview of some of the uh, information that we share, but it's about a 45 minute presentation and plus time for Q&A where we really get into the facts, figures and finances of school funding in Colorado. So if you'd like to invite us to your community to share this information, um, I'll check and hopefully tomorrow we have some signups uh, for some school funding presentations from this forum. Any quick questions that I can help to answer before we talk about, so what? What does this all mean for the legislative session? And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see your beautiful faces. If there was one change that could be made to um, how schools are funded um, to get per capita funding, at a level that seems more uh, appropriate for a state uh, with such an economy, as well as appropriate for a state with surrounding neighbors that tend to spend significantly more per capita than us, mm -hmm. what would that one change be? I would like, a lot of factors at play. What is like the, I suppose if you had a magic wand or what, what if you were to change one thing, it would result in the most significant increase in uh, school funding? Jay, it's like you're reading my mind. That is where I'm gonna take us on a journey by the end of this presentation. So Perfect. if I could put a pin in what we think a really meaningful next step would be in school funding, I'm going to get there and I don't wanna spoil it quite yet. But it's I'm like- I'm, you, I'm you, glad you're... I'm attending. All right, <laughs> thanks. Awesome. So let's get in to tomorrow. The legislative session is gaveling in. What is Great Ed looking at as we think about the 2022 legislative session? And first and foremost, I am so proud to work for an organization that leads from its values. And so I wanna start off just by sharing our policy principles with y'all so that you can see these live out in the rest of this presentation. I won't necessarily be coming back to these and revisiting them, but this is the lens by which we analyze the legislature. First and foremost, wanting to support increased funding for students in schools statewide. This is not about one district, one community. This is about all of Colorado students being able to have access to an adequately and equitably funded education. Um, we know that the they're all too scarce public dollars that are allocated to K-12 education should stay in the use of public schools. And so public dollars going to public schools, rejecting policies that create or increase existing inequities between districts. We don't wanna pit districts against districts or schools against schools, students against students when we come up with solutions. And so wanting to make sure that that also isn't happening at, at a grant or programmatic level. We wanna address the inequities so that all Colorado's children have a significant more resources available to them um, with their communities being able to determine how to best use those investments. So, when we talk about the legislative session, what we're really talking about is the legislative process. And so I'm just gonna um, do a quick uh, 101 on what is it that we, uh, who are the main players or actors that we're looking at in the legislative process? And I'll start off just quickly by sharing the governor and the executive branch 
who currently is Democrat uh, Jared Polis, plays a role in the legislative process in when it comes to school funding in two really key ways. One is the governor proposes a budget to the legislative branch, and he has already done that. And so inside of that budget are some things that we'll talk about, about his proposals, um, uh, one of them being about the budget stabilization factor. The governor also uses the power of the veto. Um, he or she has the ability to veto legislation that comes from the legislature, and that requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature to overturn that veto. So the governor does uh, have the ability to use that tool to gut, attempt to guide and influence the legislative session um, to meet their his or her policy principles or goals. But mostly when we talk about the legislative process, we're talking about the legislative branch, which in Colorado we call the General Assembly, which is made up of 100 citizen legislators. And I emphasize that citizen legislature, citizen legislators. Our legislature is in session from, official session from January um, into May. Um, in the last couple of years with COVID, it has stretched a little bit longer. Um, but uh, these are folks who live in our communities who have um, for the ability to lead and serve and represent us. Um, but they're Coloradans just like us live in our communities. And so uh, I just emphasize citizen legislature so that folks know that we want to do the best to build our communities. And that means engaging our legislators. A group of folks that I'm going to talk about a lot tonight are a committee called the Joint Budget Committee. The Joint Budget Committee is a committee that uh, oversees the budget process. And it is jointly seated between the Senate and the House. So that is where the title Joint Budget Committee comes from. It is three senators and three House reps. Um, and the majority of seats from each chamber are given to the majority party in that chamber. So right now, Democrats hold the majority in both the Senate and the House. So there are four Democrats and two Republicans on the Joint Budget Committee. These are their beautiful faces. Um, Want to give a shout out. Uh, the chair of the Joint Budget Committee, uh, Rep. Julie McCluskey, is a longtime public education advocate and supporter and a great ed advocate herself. And so we're really excited that uh, in leadership on the Joint Budget Committee, our folks uh, is specifically Rep. McCluskey who shares our values. Other committees that uh, you might be interested in learning more about that have to do with school funding or education policy, each the House and the Senate have uh, education committees. And I'm also gonna talk tonight about an interim committee that has been meeting in the off session to look at school finance. Um, and all of these wonderful chairs who you see on the screen as well, Rep. Barbara McLaughlin, Senator Rachel Zenzinger, and again, Rep. Julie McCluskey have been longtime supporters of public education and great education Colorado. And so we have lots of great leaders to work with in the upcoming session. Some key questions that I'm going to analyze three pieces of legislation that we want to bring to your attention are the following. Really, when we look at these, uh, with these bills, what is the problem that is attempting to be solved? Are we clear um, on which piece of the inadequacy and equity we're really attempting to solve for? And are we solving that problem with sustainable revenue? And the reason that I think sustainability is such an important uh, aspect to evaluate is because this is how we actually make meaningful change in how we pay our educators and how we pay all of the folks who support our students in schools in building new programs that are not one-time programs but programs that we can build alongside our communities um, that can adapt and change and meet the needs of our students across time. So one-time dollars can't address those types of issues. And so we are looking um, for sustainable revenue sources for these changes. If uh, I, after each, I'm going to open up for Q&A. So we'll do this a little bit differently than we, I won't save Q&A until the end. I'll talk about a topic, open it up for questions. And so we have three uh, topics that we're going to dig into today. One is the budget stabilization factor. Again, we talked about this in our November advocates meeting, which that recording is there if you want to dig in uh, after today. But the governor has proposed in his budget to the Joint Budget Committee a temporary buy down of the budget stabilization factor. And so this is oscillating around the budget timeline. 
So what's the problem that's trying to be solved here? The budget stabilization factor, like I said earlier, subtracts money and takes that money away from K-12 to pay for other priorities. This year alone, we're, sub we're borrowing $572 million from students, meaning, and if we look at the entire history of the budget stabilization factor since it was created in 2009, we've uh, moved nearly $10 billion away from K-12 education. So this year's graduating seniors were kindergartners when we first implemented the budget stabilization factor. So they have never lived in a fully funded education system. And that is to the tune of $10 billion. So this borrowing from the students factor, not only is money we owe students, but it is money that, again, can't be cut from the base because it's constitutionally protected. So this is money that we took away from money that was intended to help solve some of these equity challenges. And so it's important if we are going to have an equitable school funding system that we eliminate the budget stabilization factor. The current proposal in the governor's budget is to spend in this year $150 million to reduce the budget stabilization factor to about, five, to about $422 million. He's also proposing putting aside money for the next two years, $300 million, $150 million each year to, to keep the budget stabilization factor at that rate and hold it stable. However, a buy down on this timeline also coincides with when federal dollars from our schools will disappear. In the 2023-2024 school year is the last year available for ESSER dollars. That will also be the last fiscal year that the current proposed buy down will exist. So we will maintain the budget stabilization factor while at the same time having federal money disappear, those one time dollars. And we saw this happen 10 years ago after the 2008 financial recession. Once federal funding went away, the budget stabilization factor became the biggest it had ever been to that point to a billion dollars. And so um, we are looking at this as uh, an opportunity to just remind folks that in order to truly eliminate the budget stabilization factor, we need new ongoing and sustainable revenue um, that can be depended on year over year so that we can once and for all get rid of the BS factor. I will pause here to see if anyone has any questions. Also see some questions in the chat. So thanks for my team for hopping in and answering some of those. But does anybody have any questions? Yeah, John, thanks for using that raised hand. Feel free to come off mute. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand what you said mm -hmm. about the cliff and that if Polis's measure passes for the next three years and he gets the funding put it in the 300 million dollars it's not solving anything it's putting something further down the road and then when it comes back around it's going to be a bigger problem a billion dollar problem is that what i heard you say or did i misunderstand that nope thank you for that clarification so the timeline piece that you're laying out is is how we perceive it and understand it the current proposal from the governor is this year and two out years and we are in the first year of being able to spend ESSER $3. There's a three-year timeline for that. So essentially, these timelines of, of dollars will both disappear at the same time. What I was referring to about the billion-dollar number is back in 2008, uh, after the financial uh, housing market crashed, and we had three years of federal one-time dollars coming into schools to try to help with the recovery of the housing market and its impact on schools. Um, the budget stabilization factor grew to the largest that it had been since COVID um, because of that cliff that schools experienced in 2011. So what we want to avoid and what we are advocating for is being able to have a smart strategy and sustainable revenue so that schools don't fall off that cliff again in 2023-24 when ESSER money uh, goes away at the federal level. So hopefully that helps to clarify. It, it does, if I could have one follow-up and just to make sure, but thank you. Um, Great. So so what that means is that um, you're not supporting the, I guess are you are not, are not supporting the governor's uh, proposal, 
or are you asking for some something more permanent to be put in place? Is that is that the idea? I, I will do an and of that. It's in order for us to truly eliminate the BS factor, we need something more sustainable and more long term than a than a temporary buy down. Um, so while this does make progress, these are new dollars spent on K-12 education. Um, the bigger goal will be uh, generating meaningful revenue to so that we can go further than this current proposal. Right. Thank you. Uh, Tim and then Evie, and then I will I'll pop into the next piece. Um, you kind of briefly touched on, but one of the things I always think is important to note in this whole conversation is that that BS factor comes directly out of money designed the part of the budget that's designed to balance out and help small communities and, and students who are really at need. And so it really hits people that need it the most. Exactly. Um, Thank the, you. I, I think that the issue with, I don't know, the buy down is always some, somewhat of a confusing way to term some of this. They're putting money into the budget so that the stabilization factor doesn't grow this year. Um, and putting more money aside is, is something that is definitely more more future looking than they've ever done in the past. So in a lot of ways, it's a very positive thing that he's looking at it from the perspective of, I don't want this to be a one year thing. Let's make a plan. So we're covering at least three years and see where we're at from there. Um, so I kind of perceive this as a, as a very positive step that they're actually looking forward. Great, uh, Evie, and then I'll hop into the next. Oh, I think you're still muted. I would just like to ask if you could um, put your policy principles back on the screen. I didn't catch the fourth one, and I think that this is really important. The lens, you know, because your policy principles are the lens that we're going to look through at legislation. Is this what you're mentioning? Yes. And I will also ensure that these slides are posted with our recording of the meeting on our Advocates Network page. So just for the sake of time, uh, Senator Hudak, I am going to move us forward. But did you get what you needed? Oh, yeah, I did. Thank you. Perfect. Wonderful. Perfect. So the next, uh, one of the next things that we are hearing uh, in conversation as the legislative session kicks off is uh, discussions about uh, in the interim committee on school finance, hoping to propose to the joint budget committee some changes to how we measure the at-risk indicator or the equity factor in the formula. So this would all again coalesce um, coming to a head when we go towards the budget process. Historically, Colorado has used this factor again to approximate uh, students living in poverty, and this has been through free lunch participation. We have made some improvements to add reduced price lunch, but the one of the impacts of COVID is that con Congress stepped in um, over the last couple of years and has been paying for universal free meals for all public school students across the country. While this is a great um, step forward in terms of nutrition and food security for students, you can see a potential data problem that we have here in Colorado. Students, families, and schools were not collecting, uh, or where they were collecting, but there were uh, fewer incentives to turn in the free and reduced price lunch form, because regardless of if you turned in the form, regardless of if you met the qualifications or not, all students were receiving universal free meals. And so over the last couple of years, we have significant gaps in our data, and we know that we have an underestimation of the number of students who should qualify under this at-risk factor. Um, there's also a, another uh, problem that we're trying to solve is modernizing this process in a way that we can hopefully identify more students, not put the burden on students and families to have to fill out additional paperwork, um, and less administrative work for schools and districts, less work on collecting those forms, tracking down those forms, reporting those forms. And so these are kind of the problems that the Interim Committee on School Finance has been discussing that they're hoping to solve. Some current solutions that are on the table in terms of changing the formula 
um, again, kind of this theme that you're going to start to recognize of these are positive steps forward. But if we change the formula without adding how much money that we are uh, moving through the formula, this could create a scenario where we're simply cutting the pie different pitting schools against schools, districts against districts, because we've changed how the qualification or the data tracking process works. And so that is a concern that we have around not changing the formula itself, but what happens when we change the formula and remain at our current funding levels. So meaningfully improving our, our investment also means moving new and improved money through the formula. Um, also the current, uh, the current uh, hopes of the interim committee are that there will be a hold harmless period, which will have a cost, uh, making sure that districts, if they are losing money, that that is smoothed out, um, and that this will require new data reporting systems, which also take additional dollars to stand up. And so there are some things that we need to be thinking about um, as we move towards a new and improved um, school funding system. Um, Jerry, I see your hand up. So what, how does the state define poverty? Uh, I mean, is it a federal definition? Is it state? Is it district by district? Since, you know, what poverty is in Denver or Boulder could be very different than what poverty is in Ridgeway. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, so the way that this works is, is the free lunch participation, and that is a measurement against the federal poverty line based off of a family's reported income. So it's a family's reported income against a certain percentage within the threshold of the federal poverty line. So that's the current uh, definition of at risk in our state formula, the legislature has the ability to determine what any of the factors are. So that's what's up for debate right now is what should our definition be of at risk. Thanks. Does that help? Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it, uh, the federal poverty line becomes meaningless in some communities, you know, in, in, with the cost of living in the metro area so high, uh, the federal poverty line should be a lot higher. The Interim Committee on School Finance met on Monday to review a poverty study that uh, was done by the Urban Institute, which was uh, did some research on what some different indicators might be that would make sense for Colorado. They gave a short list of three top options to the interim committee. And so we're following the interim committee to see um, which uh, options they show interest in and we'll uh, continue to update folks uh, as the as this committee gives us more information over the course of the legislature. It's an interesting interim committee because they do have the ability to meet during session, um, which isn't typical for interim committees. So there's still some more that we'll learn about where this is headed. But just wanted to give folks that update here. And then just to be cognizant of time, I'm gonna share our third topic that we're following also from the interim committee. Um, and uh, then I'll open it up for questions uh, about either of these. So again, the interim committee is looking, uh, was brought to the interim committee on school finances attention through some advocacy from special from the special education community, continuing to uh, remind the legislature that we also are not fully funding our special education formula as it exists as a categorical fund. One of the things that is important to understand about special education when it comes to school finance is that students who are receiving special education services, whether it's a 504 plan or an IEP, are legally, um, are, are legally districts are legally obligated to provide those services regardless of cost. It's considered um, a, a right of students who qualify for those services so that they have access to a free and appropriate public education. And I think that this is um, one of the strengths of our public education system that we have space for all learners and want to support all learners and all students. Um, but this does come with uh, an obligation around costs that is different for other students. And this is a really um, commonly understood form of an unfunded mandate where districts are required to spend this money again, regardless of cost. So that often means if districts aren't receiving the support that they need, they are required to pull that money to pay for services from other parts of their budget. So anytime we can improve special education funding, we are at the same time improving districts ability to maintain budgets for all sorts of things in general education as well. 
So the current proposal on the table from the interim committee to the joint budget committee would be to increase SPED funding to a base amount for additional base amount for SPED students to about $1,750 uh, per student. Right now it's at $1,250 per student. So this would be about a $500 raise and adding $40 million to next year's budget for special education, even though the projected gap is uh, upwards of $50 million. But right now the proposal is sitting at $40 million for next year. One really interesting component of advocacy around this issue is that if they were to add this money into this fund, this fund is a categorical, which actually locks in the legislature to being obligated to increase that fund by inflation year over year. Because the rules of categoricals say once that money exists, that fund must grow by inflation. So if we were actually able to get this money into categoricals, that would create a mechanism that would hold the legislature accountable to increasing that money. However, in order to meet that legislative intent in future legislative sessions, that means future legislators, legislate, legislatures, excuse me, will need to identify how to pay for this in the out years. This is a one-time uh, fiscal year move as in its current iteration. And again, spoiler alert, we do not have any new ongoing revenues for K-12 public education. So before I open it up for question and answer, just wanna do just a few quick as to a summary. We do see our legislative partners moving forward with our values, but they need our support as you've heard, because in order for these to be meaningful and sustainable changes, we need to make sure that we not just achieve these legislative wins, but we have to have the money to back these wins up. And so you're going to hear a lot of folks, including us in past Advocates Network sessions and into the future, talk about the Tabor surplus. In December, we got a new December forecast, their quarterly forecast, and the forecasts show an even larger surplus than when we talked about this in the past. They're going over the next three years, there will be over five and a half billion dollars of tax revenue that we already collect under our current system that is currently locked away in this Tabor surplus fund unless we get the voters to prioritize education and say, let's spend some of this surplus on making our schools and our educators whole. And so over the last couple of years and last couple of sessions, we know that this fight for an equitable funding system is about each and every student. And it's not about one session, one year, one election. Um, and so I'm just so excited that we have advocates like you from all across the state who are going to continue showing up at the legislature and at the ballot to make sure that these two strategies of legislative work and ballot work um, can bring us um, some meaningful change. And so here is where I'm going to stop sharing my screen, open it up for Q&A. I also do want to acknowledge the time. I know we had a packed agenda and it's 527. So if we hit 530 and you do have to head out, I just want to say thank you um, for sharing space with us. Um, but I'll just slowly transition into a Q&A. And uh, as folks feel uh, like it's time for you to head out, um, feel free to do so. Um, and we will be following up this week with uh, a, a follow-up email um, asking you to make sure that you do a couple of things. Look up your legislator so you know who represents you um, so that you can contact them over the course of this session, whether it's about education funding issues or issues you're passionate about. And at February's Advocates Network meeting, we'll be able to assess what's happened in the first couple of weeks of the legislature and come back to our ballot measure. What is the best way for us to qualify for the ballot? A legislative referral or a petition gathering campaign? So I'm gonna open it up for questions. I see Tim, you have a raised hand um, and then we'll keep going from here. Um, I was curious about some of the details on the at-risk uh, funding changes. What are some of the strategies that are being discussed? I heard you say there's several ideas, but what is it that they think is going to be more accurate and easier to count? 
I will make sure that in, I'm going to make a note of this now, the, to link the report from the Urban Institute in the presentation so that y'all can see and dig a little bit deeper. It was a really great presentation, but essentially trying to look at a few different mechanisms that are more tied directly to direct certification. So uh, looking at like census block level data, because we, uh, districts already collect home addresses for students. And so um, that's one interesting way that they're looking at is can we tie um, more to the census block level uh, and get family income background that way. Um, but it is something that I am honestly going to admit that I'm still brushing up on the technical aspects of it and listen to the presentation yesterday. So in order to fully answer your question, I'll make sure that I add additional resources to the follow up email. Any other questions? I had a question. Um, yeah. So the answer to my original question, is it to unlock the table or surplus? Or is yes. it that seems like a big pot of money? Right. So Absolutely. that's the, right. Okay. So in our December meeting, we talked about what is this Tabor surplus? Yeah. It's, where did this artificial calculation come from? And what would it look like in order for the voters to allow us to access that money? And so I'll plant the seed for our December Advocates Network meeting recording. If you have similar questions, um, that's some great content there. Okay. Um, but we are looking at a potential ballot measure to reallocate some of the Tabor surplus um, towards public education. Okay, so even though you did not flag that as something that seems to be in the inner legislative workings thus far, one approach could be having that be a ballot measure that voters would vote on. Correct. The legislature, because of Tabor on their own, cannot um, unlock the Tabor surplus. They yes, change, got it. They can change the rebate mechanisms, but um, this would essentially be uh, de uh these dollars. And so this, we believe, would have to be uh, a vote of the people according to Tabor. Lisa, I would love for you to weigh in as well. <laughs> um, sure. I, I think uh, one of the things that, that always becomes clear when we start working on these issues is that Tabor is no way to run a state. Um, we're put in these positions of having to figure out when to put what on the ballot and who is going to be working on that and is it the, the uh, it, should it be initiated? Is it the legislature? How do you make sure you've got enough of funding, et cetera? So there have been a lot of conversations going on about this, but it's really, uh, I guess the main point I'm going to make here is a, t a, a, a plug for coming back in February uh, when we'll have a lot, there, there will just be some more things in place and some more decision points that we will have passed. Um, I believe when Cody shows us the the uh, the lead part, uh, part of it is ask five people to come to the next meeting. It's we we have uh, uh, we we should have more information and uh, a, a little bit more um, concrete answer to your questions, Jay. Um, but we need to be prepared. Um, before we know exactly what's going to happen, that is that is the what what uh, what Doug Bruce has done to our state is that we have to be ready before we know exactly what it is we're getting ready for. So uh, please do take a minute to think about the five people uh, you know who should be a part of this conversation, uh, and and do invite them to the next one because because every with every meeting it's going to get more concrete and I hope fun. Although this was fun, Cody, I did not. Oh, I think, I don't know if Lisa just froze for y'all, but she just froze for me. Um, but I think I hear, uh, and then Jerry, let's have you pop in and hopefully we'll get Lisa back. Uh, with the ballot initiative, uh, you know, and we've had several to try and, and modify, get rid of Tabor and they've all been unsuccessful. Um, what coalitions are we looking at to try and get this ballot initiative, not just on, but passed? Has that strategy been looked at yet or is that still a work in progress? It's definitely a work in progress, but there have been a lot of conversations for a long time since the, these 
the first time we saw that the uh, the surplus was coming back, uh, and we had this idea. We've we've really been trying to to bring in a lot of different folks, um, and uh, the the core group is the Great Schools Thriving Communities Coalition uh, that uh, brought Amendment seventy three to the fore uh, and to the ballot. Um, that's the practitioners, Case Casby, CEA, uh, the uh, BOCES, rural schools, but also social yeah. justice organizations like the NAACP and Colorado and the Arc of Colorado. We've been talking about this. No decision has been made about going forward, but we know we just need to keep giving ideas oxygen to make sure that when a decision has to be made that it's that that we have uh, given this every opportunity um, to succeed succeed. Um, we are also, uh, we've been talking to a lot of other folks in the community, uh, um, some of whom opposed Amendment 73. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it is a work in progress, as you said, Jerry, but it's very encouraging. So if you, that's the other, one of the other favorite parts of my role beyond getting to work <laughs> yeah, with all of you and meeting all of you is if you are a member of an organization or institution that would like to learn more about the Great Schools Thriving Communities Coalition, if you'd like to explore potentially joining the coalition or building a bridge between your community and the coalition, I uh, am more than happy to meet with you, share more and share more with you and learn more about you and the work that y'all do um, as a front door to the coalition. So um, same email address that you get, the Advocates Network follow-up emails from. If you want to talk more about the coalition, send me an email and let's set up some time to chat. I would absolutely love the opportunity. If I can make one quick comment on what what Christy said there, uh, doing it by petition by uh, a uh, uh, initiated measure does do a great deal to get the campaign going and get the grassroots. If there were a referred measure, what we're doing right here, this is the beginning of the grassroots. Even if there's not a petitioning campaign, it's not just about getting the petition on, it's about getting people in communities to be ambassadors for this idea. So it's the, the strongest campaigns are not watch this television commercial, it's listen to people that you trust. And so uh, either way, this is this is the ground floor of, of organizing. What, what is the dollar amount of, of the cliff that we're talking about? Bruce, it is so wonderful to see you. Hi. Thank you. Um, uh the there is a structural deficit that comes from the fact that as our economy grows we have this artificial cap the 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 taper so so it could be you know as we're giving that money away at the same time our needs for infrastructure and healthcare and uh, nutrition and schools and higher education, dealing with inflation, all of those are growing much faster than what Tabor allows us to keep. And so that is the, <clears throat> that's the structural deficit that the, uh, the governor's office has recognized that uh, we will, uh, you know, we can't know exactly what that cliff is because it depends if they decide to stop funding higher education. Or, you know, so, so um, I don't know exactly, uh, I, I, we probably can get that number from the forecast of how far behind three years from now um, our budget will be compared to keeping up with current growth and anticipated inflation. That's, that's what that number will be for the entire budget. How much of that comes out of education side is the legislative process. Thank you. These are all really fantastic questions. I'm just gonna do two quick things. I am gonna stop the recording um, and I am just going to share for folks again, 